Okay, well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to GSPA Innovative Talks. Today we have a, a very timely topic, uh, the future of public administration, agility, stability, and digitality. We are honored to have with us Professor Dr. Wolfgang Deschler. He is a professor of governance at the Bruno Nox Department of Innovation and Governance at Tallinn University of Technology. Uh, please welcome. All right. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor, pleasure, and privilege to be here. Uh, it's uh, not a particularly crowded auditorium, but then, as I always say, I wouldn't go to a PA lecture on a Saturday afternoon either. Um, I do not overrate my own area, in spite of the fact that it is actually really, really important. Um, <clears throat> and, of course, I, I always think that Nida comes up with the most ugly pictures of myself at all, but maybe the reason is only that they are not edited, whereas on our own social media, we all try to look like 11-year-old Japanese girls, right? So with the various filters, whereas I'm obviously not an 11-year-old Japanese girl. Um, but that's a disadvantage these days. Um, so let's see how we can get during the siesta time, now after lunch, uh, through about an hour of my talk on this topic, and then um, the discussion with you. Um, the uh, subject matter of public administration, as I said, it's not a particularly intriguing one. Our field is not on the level of um, black pink. It's not getting people excited. On the other hand, we do live in an administered world, both in this building and when we walk out, we are in a world that is primarily structured by public administration and administration generally. And what we study is a paradigm that orders the world in which we live. So in public administration, public management, there has always been a strange disparity between the importance of the field and the attractiveness of the field. I like to say, even at PA conferences, that when normal people read a newspaper online and they scroll down, and there is an article about PA reform that will scroll on very quickly. Yeah. But they shouldn't because it's really, really important. They also, by the way, scroll on when they see the word inflation. And it's not smart to scroll on when you see the word inflation because that might actually have extremely negative um, impacts on your life. Now, if I... I, I got this right. Um, there are not that many ties in the audience, right? You two? Okay, uh, three. <laughs> um, then um, I will probably leave this unanswered, but one of the things I was, I was thinking of starting with is in the Thai religious context, you know, the classic Theravada Buddhism plus the local traditions that you have, there is actually a divinity for PA. And this is who? Because most people can't actually answer that. There is actually a godlike person who is in charge of PA. And there is a temple in Bangkok where there is a golden statue of him. But even people dealing with PA, actually, if you ask like that, don't know who this is. So it's harsh with you three. I'm putting you kind of on the spot. If it's like 30 people, it's more pleasant to ask this because you can hide amongst the masses, um, uh, but um, I will not answer here who this is because it's a really interesting thing, but he is actually in the city pillar shrine. In, in, uh, and there are four protective deities, and the fourth one is actually in charge of the game. Um, uh, actually, um, I, I can't say why not. It's Prafo uh, Chetakup, uh, uh, and who is um, an, um, an old Indian deity, son of Lord Brahma, who was put in charge of the record keeping of people uh, when they die. Because, you know, if you have a system where there is an accounting according to the uh, karma, what have you done, what have you not, both immediately and for the long term, 
you need to uh, keep every person's records of what they've been doing. And uh, this was even too much for Lord Yama, the god of death, and so he applied uh, for another god keeping the records. And this is where we, in a way, come from. What is interesting on the general PA um, level is that this person, so basically an accountant, uh, a divine accountant of what people did or not. And you can see why this is a PA deity. You know, this is an important part of what we are doing. Um, is um, an insightful figure because it tells us where PA comes from, but also two things. A, um, even no, no matter who you are, even if you are the lord of death, you might not have the capacity yourself to fully stay in control of all the records and all the administrative arrangements. And second, it is really important on an implementational side. Yeah? You can say that if people do that, they go to hell. If the people go that, do that, they get reborn such and such. If they don't do it, you do it. But you also need to do it. First, you need to know what people did, and then you need to do it in the sense of implementation. And um, that is something that brings us very directly to our topic today. So I was not just going to tell an anecdote and say, uh, you know, take the whatever it is, number one bus to the city pillar shrine and, and put a, a, a wreath of flowers to the god of PA. But um, this insight that this figure has in telling about uh, the ethics orientation, the centrality, and this implementation focus of public administration in an administered world in which we live. This is what I'm saying. Now, um, when discussing the future of public administration, the, um, the vehicle I would do so is a topic that I have probably talked at NIDA already uh, too often about it already, and that is, um, and this is why I don't have a PowerPoint, because it's the one format where you don't have traditionally a PowerPoint, this book here. A book that I and two colleagues wrote, and uh, which you see is called How to Make an Entrepreneurial State, Why Innovation Meets Bureaucracy. Yeah, sorry for stepping down, that's not good for the camera, I know. But um, the, and I will, in order to illustrate the PA point, um, go about what this um, book is about. So why innovation needs bureaucracy. Bureaucracy is a negative word for public administration or the civil service. And some people, some friends of mine, say we need to give, um, again, a good meaning to the term bureaucracy. That's difficult because bureaucracy never was meant to be neutral. Bureaucracy was ever an insult. You're studying PA, some of you might be practitioners. If somebody says you're bureaucrat, it's never a compliment. Yeah? This is an insult. And it was meant as one. Bureaucrat is an artificial word. Um, it's, a, it's a fake word. It sounds like Greek or something like that, but somebody made it up. Yeah? You know, uh, kratein means to rule in Greek, and uh, buros, bureau, that refers to the office. So it's the rule of the office. This is what it means. If you want to go very historical, a bureau, a bureau plat in French, is actually a desk. So it was rule of the desk, not even of the office um, uh, room. So w w we think of an office as a room, like a cabinet, where, where decisions are made um, by the bureaucrat. But in reality, it's the desk. And even more traditionally, bureaus is a dog Latin name for the kind of felt with which some tables were covered. And why would you cover a table with felt? Is to do uh, accounting on it. Yeah? You know what an abacus is probably? How you can do in this old kind of Chinese way with you know, pearls on, 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 on wires, you can do accounting very quickly and like adding up things. Originally, these were not in frames, but these were loose coins on a table. And you had a rooster of these lines drawn with uh, with uh, chalk. And that is, this stuff that the table was covered with was called buros. So you see again the accounting background. Remember uh, the Lord uh, Chetako, uh, who is an accountant. 
you see the accountants background of that so it's the rule of the accounts the rule of the accountants the rule of the desk the rule of the office in a negative way because you know neither desks nor accountants nor bureaucrats should actually rule you know, ideally it's the people demoskratein so it's the democracy right and then you have other various forms of that so bureaucracy is not a positive word but the other word is positive of this book title in our world namely innovation innovation is one of these words that most people um, associate with positive things you know with the new the technological the better progress growth and all of these things just like the word entrepreneur it sounds like startup and Elon Musk and making a lot of money with Bitcoin and all of these things very unbureaucratic and there is a reason for that in the system in which we live and if this is coupled with why innovation needs bureaucracy in order to make an entrepreneurial state this is something where um, attention arises that publishers like to see because that way you can sell books so what is innovation Innovation is uh, one of the relatively few social science terms that actually have a clear definition. You can't say, my personal feeling about innovation is this. You can say that about democracy. You can say that about justice. You can interpret, there's massive amount of definitions of these words. Well, they can mean all kinds of things. Um, innovation is a very clear term. It's clearly defined. There are some arguments about it. There is one person who actually defined it, an Austrian-American economist by the name of Joseph A. Schumpeter. Um, and what it means is to bring something new. We think normally about products, can be processes, can be marketing, can be financing models, anything into the market process successfully. If it fails, it's not an innovation. Failed innovations are not a thing. Um, that is highly annoying to people who focus on value because they say that doesn't make money but it adds value but we never know what adds value although as you saw the um, institute I'm from at University College Hon is called the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose and this is all about the concept of public value now um, what is so important about innovation the thing that is so important about innovation is that these innovations bringing new things into the market is not only important on the personal level where as an entrepreneur you can make a lot of money but also for the government as such for national systems to stay competitive because technology changes the economic landscape and if production doesn't go into the direction of the new techno economic paradigms that means paradigms of specific technologies that are different than the ones we had yesterday and in which a lot of money is made then that is bad for the country because the country makes less money is less competitive sinks down can pay less social fees and so on and so on so it's extremely important for a country to be innovative in order to stay competitive with other countries and the more top your country on the list is the more innovation you need why because um, what makes the top achieving countries in the world the classic first world plus the Asian super performance right I mean Norway Canada US England Germany Singapore Taiwan and so on what makes them special is that they actually stay spend more money on their citizens than by justice if you look at the global scale they would actually deserve therefore they need to be more productive and you can only make more money than you actually per capita deserve if you have um, a strong position in an innovation based capitalist form of government that is the reason so it's actually more important for Germany to be innovative than for <laughs> from supplying super welfare to its citizens it should but it doesn't but Germany does you know, when people have gotten used to free health care and the beautiful infrastructure and they lose it they get very upset and that makes the government unstable therefore the innovation imperative is there for the top countries as well so and today you might imagine um, 
the techno-economic paradigm in which we live is the ICT um, a paradigm. We don't know what the next is. You never know what the next is. People are often wrong about it. We know what the last one was. This was the mass production one. And today, you need to either be very strong in the digital world or you need to digitalize older industries. For example, be strong in the digital world means to make smartphones or software. To upgrade means you have a good car industry. You can keep the car industry, but you need to digitalize production, marketing, financing, and so on. If you don't do it, you fall behind. Now, what I've now explained to you, and um, whether one agrees with that or not, most governments and international organizations agree with the theory I've just told you. And as what I was now talking about is, as I'm sure you figured, this is economics. This is not PA. It's classic economic policy. That means what I am saying is it is the role of the state to design innovation policy that is helpful for the country or whatever they are in charge of and their citizens. And that goes against the real radical free market guys who say, let's just the business go. But the problem is, business people don't know what is best for the country, and there is no automatism, if, even if you're a free market radical, that people will behave in an uh, innovative way as entrepreneurs that is good for the country. So direction needs to be given. Direction that needs to be given by the government is innovation policy. So, but what I've told you, how to nudge uh, a country into the right direction of industry, to go digital, to do more this, to do more that, to do tax incentive for startups, uh, to um, invest in education that concentrates on the current or future economic, the techno-economic paradigm, very few people these days are against that. There are some radical, free market people, and there is, of course, the degrowth people who would disagree with that, but basically most countries and most international organizations agree with what I've been saying. So, now, remember what I said about that guardian of PA, uh, Lord Chetak. We are talking about innovation policy. But here, in a PA environment, what we need to realize is that how do you actually do that? As I like to say, for, what will be, for 60 baht and an innovation policy, I get a nice time mortgage. Meaning, policies are actually what? Worthless. Because policies can be written on paper, posted online, but they make no difference whatsoever. A policy phrased as a policy has no effect whatsoever. It's just words. It's just like a song, where songs make money and policies, at least uh, if they're on paper, usually don't even make money. They're just there. They are just what people uh, regard. And that, by the way, explains why we have so many countries with beautiful constitutions do not get implemented at all on the everyday level. Um, the, uh, I was recently saying um, that an, an, an American justice who was saying actually the, the Soviet constitution was way better than the American constitution. Way more free, way more liberal, just it wasn't implemented at all. And so that you get a lot. So you can have a lot of paper, but it doesn't happen. What, uh, uh, in a way, Lord Chetakov reminds us of is that you need to focus on the implementation. An innovation policy is not enough, but you also need to implement it. You need to manage it, and the people who design the innovation policy, which is not the same as the general economic policy, need to push this through. They need to do that for the right technology and rightly calibrate it for big firms, for small firms, for startups, for the government-owned firms themselves, and so on and so on. This is very tough. However, even in the PA world, we get a lot of people 
who uh, prefer talking about policies and not their implementation. And we call that, in the social sciences in which we are, a policy bias. And a policy bias is, in our general field, what NIDA covers, what your degrees cover, that you tend to focus on the policies and you think if you have decided, gotten through parliament or government or whatever dictator, a nice policy, then innovation will happen in a good way. No, it won't. That innovation policy needs to be implemented. It needs to be first decided in the right way and then implemented. And that, I can tell you, is not normal. Unfortunately, this innovation policy bias is not only there with practitioners, but also with theorists. Or, we can flip this, unfortunately, it's not only there with academics, but also in real policies. But that was something that puzzled, since a long time, dealing with innovation and PA, both myself and my students. And so, over the course of time, uh, what one review has described as a nuclear academic family, myself, my first PhD, and his first PhD, Rainer Kattel, myself, and Yaki Karo, who will be a visiting professor at NIDA in um, early next year, um, we thought that is something that is missing. So you can really say that if you look at PA scholars and public policy scholars talking about innovation, well over 90% just talk about policies, but not how they are developed and not how they are implemented. And you know, the best thing to um, write a scholarly article or a scholarly book is if you study something and something is missing. And then you say, okay, it's missing, I do it by myself. The reason why I wrote my first article about e-voting in Estonia, the first national e-voting, internet voting that happened at all, was not because I was particularly interested in it, but nobody had written about it from the social science perspective. Today you have an army of people talking about e-voting and m-voting, but back then nobody did, and then I said, okay, you know, it's not that great, but if nobody does it, I do it. Um, my recent example, when I gave this lecture the last time, was in Cambodia, and in Cambodia, my, uh, you may know, the most firmus, famous Cambodian ruler ever is Jayavarman VII, the creator of the Bayon Temple, in, in Angkor. Yeah? I mean, the, 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 one of the two greatest Buddhist rulers ever, together with Ashoka himself, creator of a welfare state, a real welfare state, with social care and health policy, free health policy, a thousand years ago. Um, we do not have a biography of Jayavarman VII. It's missing. There is no serious book about him. Nothing. Not short, not long. And you wonder why this is such a central, such an important person. He's so crucial to a Cambodian identity. Why don't we have a book? So, you know, I can't write that book because I'm not a scholar of Khmer history a thousand years ago, but this is a typical example of all of a sudden missing things. So, Reiner, Erke, and myself said, okay, nobody addresses how to design and implement innovation policy. Almost all governments have departments for that, very often in Ministry of Economics, minister's office, something like that, that are in charge of innovation policy. Again, both the design, the changes over time. Innovation policy needs to shift very quickly because the situations change. High market, low market, new technology, old technology. Now, you know, chat GPT, all of a sudden, you need to switch your policies. You can't do the old stuff. And so on and so on. So, how would these bureaucratic departments, these parts of usually national ministerial administration, optimally look like to implement innovation policy. Nobody in recent memory had written a decent book about it, and then we said, okay, we do it. And that is how this book arose. And um, it... Um, I wonder now always what I say first, but let me first say this book was published with Yale University Press as a so-called trade book. That means most academic books are actually not meant to be sold. They are supposed to be sold to a few university libraries and something things. And 
chapter, usually have a book run of about three or 400 copies, English ones. It's almost nothing. And then they cost $120, which means nobody normal buys this. But um, the bigger universities' presses, like Yale, like Harvard, and so on, they also have trade books. That means books where you go, my example here is to uh, uh, the Kino Kuchia branch in Siam Paragon, and you say, do you have this book? And they have it. And they have this book. So this is a trade book. Um, the audience still, and it's also at 30 bucks, so that's a normal book price for them. Now, why? Because the press thought, okay, I mean, we wanted this too, but this is, in spite of the boringness of PA generally, such a nice topic that enough people, especially practitioners, would read this also in addition to um, just a few colleagues. And it's doing well, um, but, and, oh, yeah. it's actually doing extremely well. Uh, not only in sales, but as, I don't know whether that was part of the advertisement and so on, but this book actually won the um, highest management award for management books at all, the um, uh, George Terry Award from the Academy of Management. The Academy of Management is the largest association for classic private management scholars, and this is uh, an award for the best book in management in the last two years. This is what I'm not sure whether I should say that. I can show that it really is the best There's still nice things. So it's an extremely prestigious award you get at this annual conference. The annual conference of the Academy of Management is between eleven and sixteen thousand people. It's so big that they don't have plenary discussions because they have no rooms for them. It's gigantic. And the, the competitors were really great. Only Harvard, Oxford, and Yale people. And um, so four books on the shortlist, and we won. And as I said, thank you very much, but I did not see this coming. Yeah, but it's very nice. What that means, though, is that it shows you that the strong role of bureaucracy and innovation policy can be accepted by mainstream Anglo-American management school, business school. It wasn't the case a while ago, but so what I'm saying is not about crazy state intervention in the free economy, but it is something that managers absolutely agree with. If for some cultish reason you're such a super manager that you think innovation can go by itself, you're doing a bad service to your country. Um, what we propose when studying historically as well as theoretically how these innovation departments look, we came up with concept that explains the title of my lecture today, or at least the first two thirds. And that is the oxymoronic term of agile stability. Innovation bureaucracies must look agile and stable at the same time, and they also need to be agile and stable at the same time. Digitality comes then later. What does that mean? Oxymoronic? Oxymoron, again, a Greek word. It means a wooden iron, something that just doesn't go together. Agile stability means that this is an office in which the bureaucrats need to act generally, keep the important value of things, be sure that everybody gets the same, typical for the public sector, in times of quietude. Everybody is treated the same, but that um, as soon as challenges that I mentioned before, like the chat GPT comes, you can act very nimble, very quick, like a startup because if you do the same policies, give the same grants, promote the same situation, if the technology world upon which innovation rests has changed, you are doing a disservice. So you need to be agile and stable at the same time. That, ladies and gentlemen, is very tough. Not many people can be agile and stable at the same time. Either have classic bureaucratic types who are not agile at all, or we have the start up type with, you know, unshaven and short, sitting somewhere and doing the digital. You know the type, right? So, but you need both, and the problem is that we can see and prove historically that only systems that can imagine um, to be agile and stable at the same time can survive very well. Now, um, 
What does that mean? It means, and I don't want to go further into the issue, that offices need to have the capacity to deliver both agility and stability. But offices aren't real. Officers aren't, again, officers are just a construct. What does it mean? So the ideal thing is if in the innovation bureaucracies, the people employed there can, like in a stick shift, they can change between agile and stable. So the individual top bureaucrats can be agile and stable at the same time. That's very difficult, but the best systems have that. They are staffed with people who are able to act agile and stable both. Again, that find bureaucracy, bureaucracies like that, these are the best, but they're very rare, very few. Then, the second best is if within the office you have people who are agile and people who are stable. You have the start up type who push, and you have the solid type who are sure of the long term. And as long as one faction doesn't kill the other, this still works. Third best, if you have an agile and stable innovation ecosystem. And that means the landscape, something that is very close to what we call NIS, or National Innovation Systems, is that inside a country or a region or stuff like that, you have institutions like an iLab that push agility and others like a ministerial department that promote stability. So because they work together, the result is still both. So ideal, inside the people. Second best, inside the same organization. Third best, ecosystem. There is no fourth best. If that doesn't work, you just don't have a working innovation bureaucracy. But so this is the idea. Now, what happened with this book, and as I said, it, um, it has nicely attracted a lot of attention, sells very well, and got this huge award. So, so it's a success as a book. Um, is that people have taken this, not we, we really wanted to talk about innovation bureaucracies, but the readers have said, wait, this idea with the agile stability also applies to bureaucracies generally, not only to innovation bureaucracies. So all the story I've told you about innovation, uh, some people have said, well, it's the same about social policy, where you need more stability than agile. It is the same about um, defense. Uh, it is the same about even hu uh, human resources, um, where you need to be able to um, react to the challenges of our time, which seem to change faster and faster. But you cannot gamble with the people's retirement benefits. And you need to be sure that they're dished out in the same way. And so what was meant to be a book specifically on innovation bureaucracy, and it really says on the cover, I mean, we're not doing anything more, has been taken up as describing with agile stability an ideal form of capacity for the modern civil service, and in that sense, for the future of PA. That means that we are heading on purpose to this kind of bureaucracy. Um, difficult? Oh, yes. Complicated to manage? Expensive, incredible. But if you don't have it, if we are living in an administered world, as I said before, if you're too lax on the bureaucracy, the price for that will be much higher. For those of you who are from badly administered systems, you know how much that costs. And even mediocre level administered systems have a problem. And um, the the problem then often is to say, we hate the bureaucrats, so we want to abolish it in order to get more. But one of the main insights of decent bureaucracy theory is that the um, alternative to a bad bureaucracy is not to abolish public administration, but a good bureaucracy. And that's tough, because it's so much easier to say we want to fire all the civil servants, but it never works. It brings things to a halt. Um, how important this is, is uh, 
if I give you two examples of absolute extremes, one of the worst governments today, one of the worst governments in history, um, both the Minister of Interior in charge of EPA and the almost almighty um, Chancellor of Nazi Germany, Hitler and Himmler, hated bureaucracy and didn't want bureaucracy to happen. But they realized that with no bureaucracy, they couldn't even do their evil Nazi policies, and so they designated one person, the Chief State Secretary in the Ministry of the Interior, who was a super bureaucrat, a brilliant super bureaucrat, a very evil man, the author of the Nuremberg Race Laws, a participant of the Wannsee Conference, but he could manage these things, and both Hitler and Himmler realized Unfortunately, that if you don't let the bureaucracy run, you can't even manage World War II longer than two months. Everything will break down. On the other hand, um, as I said, one of the worst governments today is, well, it's not really a government, but it's a mafioso military takeover, and that's the case of Myanmar, in, in which, uh, which is not a state uh, by today's definition. It does not qualify as a state. It's just a criminal gang masquerading as soldiers. Um, trying to extract stuff from the country. And there you have, which was extremely weird to see, a large civil service disobedience movement. That means that bureaucracy just stopped working. And as the great Hannah Arendt has said, if a bureaucracy stops working, although then the evil governments try to kill everybody, and in Myanmar they sure do, um, literally um, hundreds and hundreds of striking civil servants have been murdered. Uh, that brings things to a halt immediately. So even the worst governments still need working bureaucrats somehow. Yeah, that is the situation that you have. Third point, digitality. But do we still need bureaucrats in a time when the entire state machination can be done by artificial intelligence? Don't we just, if we want to have a really good innovation policy in Vietnam, need to put it in in JetGPT and say, what is the optimal innovation policy for Vietnam? The great digital transformation, does it not completely change the need for high capacity public administration? or for its implementation as well. Are we not living in a time that has been, through digitalization, so radically been changed that PA and PA reform have just become completely unimportant? Now, you're all senior and smart enough to realize that if I phrase the question that way, my answer is obviously no. And you saw that my first appointment, the partner school of NIDA is Tallinn University of Technology. You might know that Estonia is famous as being the digital leader country at all. That's not quite true, but it's very good, usually in the top three or top five. The leading European e-governance country is actually Finland. The leading global country is here in ASEAN, and you may imagine what that is. It's a small, very wealthy, not truly democratic city-state to the south of here, yeah? with 4.5 happy millions and the best digital infrastructure in the world. Singapore. Now, um, why do people think that digitalization will change the public sector automatically in a positive way? It's something that I, as somebody working primarily in Estonia, have often thought about, and I think it is something like a fairy tale. It's something like a promise. You don't have to change the government. You don't have to become democratic first. You don't have to take property away from the rich families in a country which dominate it. Just for example, not making any specific claims here, of course. Um, that means through a technical change, life will get better for everybody. You know, you wake up like in a fairy tale and everything is nice and you get free candy anywhere, everybody's living peacefully. But it is actually not happening this way. What I would like to emphasize is that public administration reform and digital increase 
in the administration has literally nothing to do with each other. And it is absolutely terrible to see how many countries think that you get the civil service and the public sector reformed via what they call digital transformation. Now, digital transformation is a cool word, also here in the title. Everybody likes digital transformation. The problem is that digital transformation is what we call a Mickey Mouse word. It doesn't mean anything, and it never happens anywhere. What is digitization? Digitization is if I change documents from the analog to the digital. So I make a picture of a written document, I put it into the digital, I use a reading program, and then I can fill out things, for instance, as a PDF or as a Word document, I can sign it, whatever, right? That's digitization. What is digitalization? Digitalization is not texts, but processes. Digitalization means I can declare my taxes online, because that process has been digitalized. Very often part of digital IDs, digital signature, digital identity. That's part of it. Banking, that you don't only have digital currency, I'm not talking about crypto here, that's just a scam, but uh, that you can do this banking, but also that you can then use that, pay your taxes online. And so, forth. so that is digitalization. Now, digitization, check. Digitalization, check. What is digital transformation? Now, some people will say to have like a lot of this new digital stuff, digital services. That's not digital transformation. That's just digitalization. And we don't need a new word for old things. Ladies and gentlemen, what we normally and strictly call digital transformation is not only the text, not only the process, but the organization changes digitally as well. That means digital transformation would mean that the organization that implements digital changes changes organizationally itself. In other words, digital transformation, for us PA geeks, is visible in the organigram. The organigram has changed. The hierarchies, the arrows, who does what. If you don't have that, you don't have digital transformation. And that is why I can stand here on that NIDA stage and say so boldly, there is almost no digital transformation. Not in Estonia, not in Finland, not in Singapore. What does that mean? These are the top, for instance, e-service delivering countries. Social ministry does social aid, supplies this digitally, great, that's digitalization. But has the inner hierarchy of the ministry changed? Answer, almost never. So that is why I'm saying digital transformation is a Mickey Mouse term, because if we use it specifically, it doesn't happen empirically. And if we don't use it empirically, if we use it very loosely, why do we use this word? Then it's a Mickey Mouse word for sure. So, why is this important? It is important, especially if you think that digitalization is important and is the main technology of our time. Because if I have a fairy tale attitude towards technology, I will.
say that the transformation of public administration would be uh, taught in the same way or be taught about in the same way like uh, agility, uh, stability, and digitality. Like, uh, because the, the concept I have before now is that we have the old system uh, uh, of public administration, then we have the new management system, then we have, right now we have the good governance and all of that. Now, and everybody is talking about the new management and the new gover the good governance, right? So would we say that digital transformation or digitality, uh, would we say that, because your, your, your presentation is saying that we can, the old system, this can actually be infused into the old system. We don't have to discard it, right? So where, where does the good governance uh, system come in? Like, is it, do we have a way to like balance all of this? Okay, so because these are big questions, I will address them before, I will not collect. Okay. The first one, uh, let me say, and then I will go for the second for a mini lecture. Okay. Because um, well, that's really necessary also in this context here. So well, just to say this very clearly, I'm a German. I'm a German citizen, I grew up in Germany, and I define myself as a German, not an Estonian. I'm only a professor in Estonia since a very long time, and there was a time in Estonia where over 50% of all PhDs in digital government were my PhDs. So I've been really been there. I, I arrived in Estonia before that were digital. They're old. They're really old. 
Um, the new public management, in short, is a market-oriented economic ideology with business principles of which even business and management have moved on. And let me say once again, there is almost no cases of NPM as such being positive, and very few cases of individual NPM reforms working. There are almost zero in the global South. Almost zero. I can tell you a few in New Zealand, which is today the most anti-NPM country in the world. Um, it used to be the main thing. Um, I know a few tools where things have happened well in Finland, once again, and things like that. But mostly these are very solid systems with classical PA. The ideal paradigm for a functioning PA, globally speaking, today is in my opinion, but I am biased here, so you have to watch it, but I'm not biased, the neo-Bavarian state, which is an upgraded version of traditional PA, rather than this nincompoop, semi-criminal NPM. Yeah? Uh, and indeed, it is sometimes so that in Sub-Saharan Africa you do get some hope for NPM. Why? Because you are so upset about your ill-working, corrupt PA that you think a home cleaning program can improve that. But if you just clean everything, or if you clean your house by acid or by bombing it, you don't have a house. The question is, what do you replace it with? And there is no functional NPM system within which to do this. Now, what is very interesting is that the, com uh, the combination of NPM and digitality was a time, but trust me, it's long ago, when people thought that digitality can be better promoted in system than in the classical PA system. That's obviously not the case. Classical Bavarian PA can easily digitalize and has its attention to hierarchies, to records, to equal treatment is exactly what is the logic, in fact, the DNA of the digital world. Um, and uh, what we do not have is a specific world of digital governance, that means of a PA system that is informed by digitality. And I'm really surprised that we don't have that. I'm always waiting for that, that somebody comes up with a theory. A couple of books, a couple of articles, none of them were convincing. So once again, digitality seems better mirrored to extremely well-working traditional PA rather than to NPM. And if you promote good governance values, which can go either way, the first question you always need to ask, certainly in the global south, is good for them. More questions? Oh. Yes. Oh. In, Online you, question? Yes. <laughs> the us form for like a form that uh, can you il il illustrate uh, scenarios where digital transformation has happened mm -hmm. in the public administration yes. governance? As it is surprising to hear from, from you that there are accent of that in Finland, Estonia, and Singapore. Yeah. Yeah. So again, uh, surprising. I hear the criticism, but it's a simple empirical question. What I propose is that um, digital transformation means the organization that does the transformation changes in itself. That means the structure needs to change. And I mean the real structure, not the legal structure, because we know about formal structures, right? So, uh, it's the organigram, but it needs an organigram that's real. Not putting a block over another block where there is actually no command, but truly how it influences that. And my argument would be that if you look at Ministry of Economics today in Estonia, and 10 years ago, and 20 years ago, it looks exactly the same. And that's not a surprise. Um, the same thing is uh, again, in Singapore, a structure which is extremely efficient, but what makes Singapore special, remember, is an ultra-high trust of the citizens in the administration. Mm -hmm. We have that nowhere else, and this is a typical hallmark, by the way, if I may make an NWPA point, of Confucian systems. In the West, you never get that much trust. Yeah. Only in Confucian systems do people say, have an almost religious attitude towards the PA and say, you go ahead. You know, that mandarins are basically having a mandate of heaven. Can't you? That is very special. But in most Confucian systems, that's not true. I mean, it doesn't happen this way. But in Singapore, it does. In Singapore, 70% of the people will 
tell you, I want the government to know at every time where I am. So if something happens to me, they can get me out. Whereas in mainland China, the government does know where you are and can get you out in 20 minutes, but also they can get you in, namely jail, if you disagree with anything. If somebody says Dalai Lama to smile, you go to jail, right? Now, in Singapore, this is a harsh system, but it is a system that a large number of people agree with, and in which the productivity of the bureaucrats has truly been in the everyday, everyday public interest of the citizens. And what do people really care about? Yeah? Cat litter, trash collection, healthcare, things like that, public security. This is so important, and if you can perform well, you also let that bureaucratic structure um, do digitality for you. So they are allowed to experiment and do stuff in the public interest. They don't need to prove all the time that it works. So, and this performance is, is just really good. Um, in Estonia, it's more difficult to say because Estonians would love to say, look, we had real digital transformation, but they don't. Let me, however, say one thing. The last master's thesis that I advised in Estonia, I usually focus on PhDs, but this was what I did, is with the Chief Digital Strategy Officer of Estonia. And she wrote about what Estonian movers and shakers, that means the key stakeholders, think when they say digital transformation, because she's in charge of doing the digital transformation strategy. And what I find interesting here is, and I can say that without leaking anything, that um, amongst the eight key players, there's no consensus of what they mean. So, there's no functional consensus. And that's very important because, I mean, it's good that you wrote this thesis, now it's part of the strategy, that can they agree on what digital transformation actually is. But, so it is extremely difficult to say, but if in Estonia, the eight main people can't agree on what digital transformation is, how would anyone else yeah? What kind of concept is that? And that is why I'm so careful, as I'm sure you noticed, to say this is what I mean, and it's a very strict definition of digital transformation, and it needs to be organizational. Otherwise, it's a useless word because we have words for other phenomena. But again, it's really important for me to say not everybody agrees with this. This is, however, what I propose. And now, it was also asked to give concrete examples. So, we do have a couple of um, departments, offices, places in ministry where the organization did change. That means where you got more lateral. You, um, I mean, Manuel Castells, the great sociologist of the internet, who came actually up with the name of the Network Society. That's his invention. Three more book about that, and then Communication Power, the great book about what it means and who dominates the social media sphere. Um, uh, he, is, he is talking exactly about these kind of transformational issues of what it can uh, possibly mean in, in this background. What you do get is a change in organizations with a tendency, I find that interesting, to um, deal with uh, finance and money. And part of that reason may be that uh, the one place where radical quantification and neural orientation is necessary is obviously in the finance world, right? It's the one thing where quantification can never be denied, even if you would be against that. And so what we see is that we, for instance, have tax offices where the actual interaction between the hierarchies has changed. Again, what I meant with Castell is Castell says at one point that if you look at the network, and you take it in the middle and you lift it up, it looks like a pyramid. That means very often networks are actually not really networks, but hierarchies again. So you have to be extremely careful. But we do have, including for instance in Estonia, uh, units in the customs and tax office that have changed their appearance. Um, that um, is a really, really interesting thing. The tendency is general means that it's finance ministries, which in many countries are in charge of digital reforms, and the, the tax, the customs, this world, that they have uh, changed towards that. However, this only works in particularly transparent and already free societies, 
because if you allow changes in the customs department, that's one of the first places where people get the cash, right? I mean, that's great appointments. In dictatorships, everybody wants to be a border guard or a tax collector, right? Because then, you know, 90% go to your pocket. Right? So, by, and, and this is why it's not there. You can only allow changes in the fiscal administration if you're really sure that everything works by the book. But where this is the case, we see such uh, transformation, tendentially speaking. Um, what we have also seen um, is a re-digital transformation. This is just a side thing, uh, but more in the NGO or semi-state sector. Why is that so? Um, we have, in PA history, the tendency um, from the cooperative and the community base to the hierarchical. Because hierarchies can decide very fast and very efficient. Um, think about, for instance, that all military is hierarchically organized, although we try to move to a more network thing. But if you discuss, you know, march and shoot, and the soldiers say, well, we should make this guy that that, that, in a better situation, is a problem. That means, as soon as a crisis comes, people go hierarchical. This is a tendency you can really see. Uh, crises increase hierarchy. Um, but the question is, is it a good hierarchy or a bad hierarchy? That's what I was going to say. Still, we had certain cooperative mechanisms of administration of property, of land, of public service provision that became obsolete because in a differentiated society of the mass production paradigm, late 19th or early 20th century, uh, this that everybody needed to get together and discuss things just didn't work anymore. A uh, student of mine, a PhD of mine, from my boss of Paul, from Nepal, has written about a form of Buddhist cooperatives called Buddhis, which Nepali Buddhis in the area of Kathmandu, which was a highly developed Buddhist society, had, and in which the people cooperated for water supply, for old age insurance, and so on. But the water supply was for everybody, not only for the Buddhists. So, but it was really very discussion based, very community oriented, and without much leadership. And that became obsolete and was just basically a folkloristic thing. But with the advent of Facebook and WhatsApp and Telegram, and I'm not sure whether the, the, the goodies are much on TikTok, I think not. I mean, there's, again, you know, no, no 30 second skips from, from Blackpink or whether the goodies move. But um, this kind of cooperative, deliberative way of supplying public services all of a sudden is very efficient because you just ask a question, you have a push message, everybody decides, and we can go. So, um, this is a re digital transformation or a digital re transformation in that we go back to an older system that, however, was for many people a better one because cooperative governance, as you know, gives you a lot of meaning, a lot of identity. It, 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 in peace times especially, makes for a very beautiful world. Yeah? And that um, got introduced here, but already Schumpeter has said, if you say, is that an innovation if it existed in the 18th century? What Schumpeter says is something that is newly introduced into the market, including things that used to be there, but have been forgotten. So if something is not currently done, but it was done in the past, and we now use it again for innovative reasons, that is classically also an innovation. It's a bias to say that innovation needs to be super high tech. Um, if you get a good idea from the past, a good financing model from the past, a good form of communication can still be an innovation. And so I have an innovative digital transformation in the Pali Buddhist cooperatives through social media. And that is a real example for digital transformation.
they always put public administration as the least considered uh, course that someone wants to study, right? So there, there seems to be like a low interest uh, on this. Uh, okay, so why is it so? Like, does it mean that there's something we are not doing okay, right? Uh, talking about operating governance too. Is it the same thing like open governance? Because uh, 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 in my country, for example, I keep using that as an example, we, we've seen a situation where the government, uh, uh, the policy makers are highly influenced by uh, tweets, uh, Facebook posts, and a lot of that. Like, so would we consider that a kind of digital transformation or digitality or cooperative governance? Like, I wanted to clarify on this. All oh, right. Uh, so, as long as the politicians get elected the same way and so on, and it's just a form of communication. This is a communication innovation, but not yet a digital transformation. Okay. The digital transformation would be if some duck-faced influencer becomes deputy minister. <laughs> yeah, and we're not quite there yet, although some people are working on it, of course. Okay. Uh, that's that's indeed the truth. Um, you did have. Um, a fairly radical incursion into this field in Taiwan, for instance, yes. with Audrey Tang and stuff like that, but that is just in the digital field in itself. Yeah? So um, it's, it's not uh, an overall one. I would challenge your assumption that PA is always at the bottom of the interest list. So this is often the case, but as you said, it's, and as I said, we also need to face our area is not particular. Yeah, we are. This is PA isn't that cool. And if you say I'm studying PA, a lot of people whom you meet in the bar will say, "Oh." <laughs> Whereas, um, and this kind of solidity, you need to be a little bit older. And in a culture that is called kidult, that means in which adults behave like kids, uh, where we use optical images. Again, TikTok is for children. Yeah. Um, Hello Kitty was designed for four to seven year olds. Today, it's the main brand for a certain group of females all over Asia between 23 and 27. Yeah? So, we are, we are behaving like small children, we dress like children. This entire idea of the leisure suit, jogging pants and hoodie. That's, if you're 14, you're already too old for this. And yet, all the startup people do that. So, this is where the digitality comes in very, very importantly, and the more you need to called society, the more this digital stuff is really important. And there have been changes in this also because of the techno-economic dominance of the digital. The real big money which so many people really want is to be had in startup. Though. Look at the value of digital firms and look at, I mean, ridiculous, embarrassing basket cases of people like Elon who are still a hero for so many people. And you look at this guy and you say, you want to be like this? <laughs> Obviously a failed human person. Oh, that's not a very good thing to say, you know what I mean? But, you know, a highly troubled person, I think I can say. Um, on the other hand, look at um, Taiwan, as digital as it is, with this extremely high demand of people taking the civil service exam administered by the examination one. Taiwan has five branches of government, one of them is PA. It's administered by a special super ministry where you get in, classic Chinese thing. Look at the traditional case, uh, Francis Fukuyama at one point says, in imperial China, the only meaningful career was the civil service. Um, for a very long time, the very top achievers, who have top offices ranked, went to Oxford, went to Harvard, went to MIT, in Singapore, went into the civil service. Today, this is only the second choice, just like in Japan, but it is the second choice. First is international finance institutions, because you earn even more, and it seems somehow cooler. But still, I think it is fair to say that in Taiwan, Japan, Singapore, the number two career choice is civil service, and the number one study, the number two study field would also be PA. These are super high performing countries. Um, traditionally, the number one school in which you could study, the ENA, École Nationale d'Administration in France, is the PA school. The very, very smartest people in their field 
study as the first graduate school after the first degree, study PA. Just examples like this. So, um, The problem is that the image of PA is specifically low in the United States, and the United States has the most PA schools. But American administration is actually terrible. It's below mid-level. Yeah. America is not well administered, but it's so powerful that it can manage that, and it has some extremely good places of PA, including innovation bureaucracy, which is top. But normal state and local administration in the U.S., people who study PA are usually those who try to get into law school and got rejected. And so they go for an MPA. Mm. Yeah, so it's bad college graduates. And that, with all the American cults, American movies, American orientation, makes us look at PA as a sorry place. And it is indeed true that um, there is a tendency of people getting an MPA. You can't get a BA in PA in America. And it's not as you can, but in America you cannot. There are no other regulations. And if you were bad in your undergraduate education and couldn't get anything better, you may study PA. Wow. That is a problem for our field because the top PA professors are American, and so our field is extremely American centric. 85%, not anymore, but a while ago, of case studies in Korean PA textbook were from the US or for Korea is way better administered than the US. And that's a post colonial phenomenon. The Anglo-American dominance, although they're not even that great. So this is a situation in which we are, and it explains a little bit what you've been saying. Thank you. And you have a... Oh, okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, special lecture, and also uh, seems like you are much more knowledgeable on the very Buddhism and also uh, Asian, you know, knowledge <laughs> of, compared to me, at least. Yeah. <laughs> when, when you talk about those the deities, for example, I don't really know all of them. And then I also appreciate it, the way that you try to, you know, uh, discuss things by saying it's in your own perfect perspective, not, not as it real for all the people. So when I listen to you about the, the you know, like the disparities of the comprehension on concepts, right? For example, digitality, digitalization, digital transformation, well, it also happens in well, in my own country, but not, not only for the digital transformation thing, but also on a larger uh, innovation thing. Like, for example, we, we also know that uh, innovation can come in terms of products, services, and also the governance, right? But then, many other organizations in, in, in my country, for example, they, they try to claim that their innovations are in the governance terms, but actually they're just products and services. Like, like, to give you some examples, I, I was in a part of a team to assess the, you know, like the local administration uh, organizations that they, they try to claim an award for being an innovative organization. But then the, the means that they, they use to claim is like new patterns of uh, high clothes, you know, high graphics, and then they claim it as uh, innovation in administration. So I also uh, listened to you, uh, to your answers uh, about the, you know, the different consensus uh, among the, 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 even though in your in, in Estonia, right, uh, on the concept of digital transformation, right, what what are they? Even though they, they try to be the leader of it, right. So I would like to ask you, uh, okay, uh, consensus among the, the same concept, even though in the bureaucracy is very hard and challenging to, to to reach, right. But then, would it be possible? And also. Uh, have there been any successful cases that, that the seemingly complex concepts are, you know, like, are reached in consensus and, and being implemented in a fully uh, full form? Yeah. Uh, yes, they are. And here I have a real weasel answer to you. The cases where innovation policies are reaching consensus and then successfully implemented, that's the main basis of the case studies of the moment. So, see how far gone it is. <laughs> so, uh, you know, BTS, see how you get out, you get in, you buy it home. Um, if I'm back, I'm happy to sign it. Or you take a digital copy, which I can't sign. So there is this. So th these things um, happen, but interestingly here, okay, we're going over time, but I guess that's okay, um, that they happen, and we, we were sometimes confused that this book only shows the top leaders that means the most successful countries. 
This is true by actually last month, uh, the Brazilian Innovation Agency proposed a uh, study of mid-level innovative countries to study with our theoretical paradigm and then see what they did, because Brazil is a classical thing. And you know what the one of the case studies is going to be? Uh, Thailand. Uh, because that is a classical case here. Now, why I know a little bit about it is, although it sounds kind of weird, but I'm regarded kind of a Southeast Asia expert, also on these subjects, also as far as bureaucracy is concerned. For instance, in the Thai Journal of PA, a while ago, was one of the keynotes at the 60th anniversary of Mila, I had a lesson on Buddhist PA, and actually Buddhist PA is one of my favorite areas at all. It's a very small area, even smaller than Buddhist economics, but it does exist. Um, more as a theoretical field than as a because uh, most Buddhist countries do not practice Buddhist in any way, but old versions of Western. Uh, allow me to briefly, I mean, so innovation policy in Thailand is also a favorite topic of mine, both in advice and academically speaking. And I've been on a lot of boards of theses of Thai studying in the West and doing an PhD of innovation policy in these places. And it's very interesting what they feel free to say and what not. But, there is an important thing here that is also reflected in the way you ask your question. So what I think is that the top players in innovation policy and practice in Thailand absolutely, you're right, are at the top level of the discourse. They do know that. The key directors, the, those ministers, not all ministers, but there are ministers for this, economics ministers and so on, who know absolutely this. There is, they have nothing to learn. So, Thailand is a country, and I can tell you about a lot of Southeast Asian countries, or I could if the camera would be on, in which this is not the case. That means in which the senior bureaucrats and the senior politicians do not have a fully developed concept of innovation policy and its implementation. In Thailand, it's there. So, is it implemented? I think I'm not hurting any Thais present if I say no, it's not, or if so, then in a patchy way. So, we really have a conceptual understanding, implementation, dissonance. So why do we have that? Why do the top people know how to do top level innovation policy and yet it's not implemented? And uh, that is something for you to ponder about and not for me to say, but I can say that very often when this is the case, when people have an understanding of what should be done but it's not implemented, either it's a form of lethargy or it's political. I leave it at that. <laughs> it, we do have to recognize that it is not of in the interest of everybody doing economic policy to push for innovation policies rightly understood, and that's when you get shadow play rather than the real thing. So that that can happen. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, for innovation, uh, innovation policy we know that there's idea come from outside in and bottom up, right? But uh, we need to shift our logic around that we call a uh, citizen-centric approach that's very opposite the ways of working of the time for the administration. So, uh, how can we solve this problem? And what is the role of the central government? Oh, yeah. Uh, so, it allows me to say one of my favorite things, and that is that for any reforms in Southeast Asia, the first thing is not to ask people to look like me, because people who look like me have a disastrous track record in giving advice in this region, as well as also in Africa, for instance. I mean, really, look at me. This is, I look like the worst kind of people giving advice on how to restructure the state for at least two and a half centuries, right? Uh, that's a fact. And, um, Although Thailand is a special case, it's never having been a, um, a colony, and actually the first person giving, uh, the first Western, the main Western, giving advice on PA reform to uh, King Chula actually said, keep more Thailand, do less Western. And it was the king who said, no, I'm sorry, we have to be more Western in order to avoid colonialism. But the Western advice is to keep more traditions from from Ayutthaya in the Thai system. This is not very often understood, but that's the real story. So that the, the Belgian legal scholar was the main advisor on PA reform to to uh, six. He, he, he was absolutely aware of, of these issues. But the problem is one of calibration. 
you cannot do uh, reforms out of context and um, uh, looking citizen-based in a hierarchical system in which strong powers try to circumnavigate citizen-basedness doesn't work. So in the end, that's the same with the innovation policy and that's the same with the digitality. If you want it to happen really um, small change reforms bottom up don't change the power structure that is, but you do need to change the power structure that is in order to implement meaningful reforms. That is a sad insight because many of us would love little nice cooperative bottom up start up things to change the world, but no. You have to change the world and then do these reforms to become meaningful. It's not fully true. This is again a tendency, so there are also cases for the opposite. And there's nothing wrong in trying, but for the tendency, um, um, small time innovative pockets will not change the bigger structure, but the bigger structure needs to change in order for them to become. And again, here I would say that is my perspective. There are serious colleagues of mine who would think it's different, but I think the track record. Uh, is there a way we can get this so uh, he can sign for us too? The, the <laughs> can we get it from Nida here? Because we need his signature right now. But we don't have to. No. I'll come back. And I'll even come back this month probably. So. Oh, okay, please. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. No, but that's, that's the nice thing here. When we, we had a big book presentation with various comics on the panel, which you kindly moderated in November, so a real book launch. Okay. And, and actually, the bookshop came here with piles of books that you could directly um, sign. It was very nice, and they sold almost all of them. But yeah, as I said, I'm not kidding. You can buy this thing in real bookshops. <laughs> I don't know. Is this Nina bookshop open? I don't know whether we have it. Probably not. But as I said, is it is open? The Nina bookshop? Yes, yes. Fortunate water buffalo size. <laughs> 